be students in the nursing program. Okay. Thanks for joining online, Katie. I appreciate it. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm Morgan Ellis. I'm one of the TL1 fellows participating from Auburn University. I'm in the Department of Chemical Engineering here, but I'm working with um, some of the pediatric um, cardiac surgeons at UAB. Okay. Well, good morning, Morgan. Good to have you online today. Good morning. Hi. Hi, this is Tanikia Taylor-Clark. I am a PhD nursing student. My mentor is Dr. Patricia. Okay, and are you at UAB as well? Yes, ma'am. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And Megan, I think that it's you. Oh, I was just wondering, how, how much longer should I pause? Um, this is uh, Megan Bronson. I am the research navigator with the LACATS program. I'm in New Orleans, and I'm housed technically at Tulane University, but um, through working with LACATS, I'm kind of all over the state and represent and work with uh, people at LSU New Orleans, LSU Shreveport, Xavier University here in New Orleans, um, a, a variety of, of universities and locations. Um, so. Thanks for putting this all together. Absolutely, thank y'all for coming, appreciate it. Uh, if you want to jump in at any time, feel free to, just like people here. This is an interactive session. I know it's much harder to talk about networking when you're trying to do it online or via internet, uh, via technology. So feel free to jump in, you guys, okay? So now I'm gonna have you guys introduce yourselves to them and to each other. Jamie, you wanna start with? Hi, I'm Jamie Anderson. I'm a second year PhD student in health sciences research. Okay. I'm Emily Levitan. I'm an associate professor of epidemiology. I'm Haley. I'm a graduate student in medical clinical psychology program. Mm -hmm. I'm Bruce Trillian. I'm a fourth year medical sociology PhD student. I'm Chapel. I'm Jay Davis. I'm a first year BA quality scholar. Program. Hello, I'm Giovanni Nami. I'm a postdoc from Italy. Um, my mentor is Dr. Sai. I'm Sarah Rutland. I'm a fifth year um, PhD student in medical sociology. Um, I'm Trudy Horton. I'm in preventive medicine and general internal medicine um, program director for the clinical and population health sciences program. I'm Mike Motivero <clears throat> in uh, infectious disease. All right, and I'm Becky Ramey, and I'm so glad to be here, and so glad that you guys are here, that with the fog and the weather and everything else, that you decided to come out this morning. I was wondering, why did you come out? Like, what about this topic interests you? Friday morning, it's been a long week. I think there are always, there's always something new about networking that um, can be shared or I can learn, so just curious what other aspects I hadn't thought about. Okay. I'm not very good at it, and it's something you actually have to practice at. I mean, you can read a book about it, but you actually have to practice it to, to get better at it. Absolutely. Yeah. Nobody told me about networking ever. So. <laughs> okay. Well, there you have it. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm Megan Bronson. It's so important, I think, and you know, with and everything else that we have on our plates, I think a lot of us don't have time to devote to it. So to have an hour where we are given that opportunity, to me, that's great. Yeah. So do you all feel like you know each other? Do you feel like you're networked in this room? You've seen each other many times, but should we have already been networked? Like, should we already know each other by this point? How many times have y'all been here? Roughly. <laughs> How many Fridays? Ten? Yeah. Ten? Did you say ten? We're 13 weeks in the semester. We just ended the semester, so roughly ten. So should we already know each other after spending an hour and a half with each other every week? Maybe? So that's really what I want to get to today is not only how we do networking events, but how do we network in our daily routines? And we're going to get into some of that. But why network? So, let's see, maybe I can do this. I do something wrong. Oh, 
There we go. Okay. So I love talking about social capital. Uh, what do you think about social capital? What do you think when I say that term? I love Robert Putnam. I don't know. Just Pierre Bordeaux. Or two hundred. I was going to say four dudes. Yeah. Yeah. Social capital. What, what makes you think? What do you think of that? Marx. <laughs> What's that? Marx. 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 Okay. Yes. Okay. Capitalism. Yeah. Okay. So sort of like the really like favors or like the people you can ask for help, sort of. Yeah. Or favors or, or people who would might ask. Yeah. You know, that sort of uh, relationship of yeah. who will take you to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> so social capital kind of fits in with networking because you're constantly building your social capital. You're constantly adding to it in different ways and different means, and then you give away your social capital at times too. Here in the CCTS Training Academy, we love buckets. So I have uh, this handout for you. These are your buckets. You have your input of social capital, and you have two output buckets. So if you consider what all are you inputting into your social capital? What are your networks that contribute to who you are, to how you how do you create your social capital? A challenging year. So, Sorry. <laughs> so, social capital is all about the networks that you're involved in, whether it is social club, whether it is your friend group, it is your professional life, it's your personal life. All of those things go into building your social capital in your network. So, what are those things that contribute to your social capital? What organizations are you involved in? When you think about networks that you're involved in, what are those networks? So one of those buckets, just kind of write everything down that you can think of. So mine is like church. And of course, like my classes that I teach by um, you guys here. Do our friends online? <laughs> you can do friends online. No, no, no. Yes. Our, our remote joining oh, yes. friends online who are inter networking, distance networking. <laughs> are they engaging in this activity as well? Well, yes. Yeah, so if y'all will draw three buckets and then put those buckets. This is the handout that I gave out this morning. So thank you for referring to that. But three, three ideas. One of them being your input. What do you, what goes into your social, social capital bucket? What contributes to it? Hey Becky, I'm sorry. Could you tell me one more time? What are the three? So just the one is going to be input, okay. and then you're going to have two outputs. Okay. So how do you give away your social capital? So we're thinking about input. just input right now. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, one more question. Personal yeah. and professional. Personal and professional. Because when we think about networking, all of those people are in our network. So the reason that this is important is because this is your sphere of influence, so to speak. The more social capital you have, the more influence you have. The more influence you have, the more powerful you're perceived. The more powerful you are, the more people want to be part of your network. So your social capital continues to grow basically because of itself. So if you consider that and how this impacts you as a researcher or in your daily roles, well, let me ask you that. How does that impact you? 
when your social capital, when your network grows, how does that impact you? You have more people to reach out to, and there are more people who know you as a person that they can reach out to. Yeah. yeah. You Just you have more resources to buffer negative experiences and stuff like that. That's why. Yeah. But on the flip side, I think sometimes for me, uh, I struggle with um, networking, um, like Sarah. Um, sometimes the more it grows, the more I. I'm concerned that I'm spread thin and is the quality of that capital, you know, you like the kind of quality versus quantity yes. trade off. Yeah, and we, we are going to get to that in just a little bit, but I agree with that, that it can be overwhelming at times. Like every day. <laughs> but again, this is your sense of belonging. These are the things that go into building up your social capital. Do you see on those activities, those things that you wrote down in your social capital bucket, do you see something that relates to each of these? A little bit, maybe? Okay. So we're going to come back to social capital in just a little bit. But networking. So why do we network? Again, build our social capital to expand our influence, right? Other reasons that you would network? Um, people are going to cross people that might be looking for something that you have or that you have something that they might be looking for. Okay. So, again, the reciprocity that I just talked about. Okay. Or that was just in the slide. Okay. okay. So, some tips for networking talk to everyone. <laughs> Let me ask you this. I talk to everybody down the street. Uh, my husband will not sit with me on the plane because I always talk to the person next to me, and it drives him daddy. Uh, when I was flying with a friend of mine, and we hadn't really done that much together before, but she went out to Colorado with me, and um, she said, oh my God, you're one of those people who talks to everybody, and this was in the first five minutes getting into the airport. <laughs> so I do, I talk to everybody, but it's a good habit to get into because then you are constantly thinking about those connections. When we talk about the translational thinker, and we've had these focus groups about translational thinking and what makes people translational scientists, they've come back and said, you know, the, the most times in two of the focus groups that I went to, this was the overarching thing, is that if we can recreate the Delta Sky Miles little place that they sit and talk here on campus, then we'll have more translational science because people talk on planes and talk when they're in a captive audience in captive places. And so it made me start thinking about, well, if we could do that, if people do just start talking to each other about their research, maybe this starts to happen more naturally than these situations we put ourselves in. So talk to everybody. Does anybody else talk to everybody? Just me? If you're on the elevator with me in, um, in F-15, always talk to people in F-15 elevator. Uh, so then, friends, quote unquote, this goes back to who are we friends with and how do we deal with those friends. Uh, the research shows that Really, your friends, your internet friends, typically do not add to your social capital. That they are not considered part of your, your network, your social capital in that way. Because they're, they're not authentic in nature, most of those situations. And then in business literature, it says that if you have friends on Facebook, like your friend group should be between 600 and 800. Because as employers, you're looking at, they start looking at how many friends you have and the authenticity of those relationships. And so any more than that, they tend to think that you're not necessarily, you know, a good fit in some direction. So that's just some tidbits about that. Yeah. Any thoughts about that? How about if it's less than Oh, what about less? I, you know, not, then not really. Maybe less that you're... I don't know. That, that you just keep a closer network, I guess. So more. I think it depends on context. So um, Ellen, who's your last? Yes. Week? I met online. <laughs> so I feel like that's a 
you know, it sort of depends. I mean, I, I don't use Facebook very much, but you know, through a different like um, mostly women in academics forum, you know, I met Ellen, and so that's a much more engaged situation. Yeah. I, you know, I think in different situations, you're exactly right, because last week she was saying, you know, if you're trying to use Facebook, like Bertha Hidalgo, to beef up your research, to get your research out there, and of course your friend groups in these spaces would be greater, and you're using that as a blogger, again, so it's, it's different, but that was, that's just kind of what the literature says about certain jobs, how about that, in the business world. So who do they know? We sustain about 150 people socially that we can, so they're going back to your statement mugs, it's about 150. That's what you, you should try to sustain relationships with. I was just checking, I have 650 Facebook friends. There you go, right there. You're right in the middle. Yeah, I know. No more. Um, so I have students that have well over 2,000, and it's really interesting because how do you even, you know, why at that point? Maybe some of you do, and I'm not judging, but that's up to you guys. Um, so the other interesting thing is that if everybody you know would introduce them to everybody that they know, seven times, sevenfold, then you would know everyone in the world. Does anybody else want to know everyone in the world? Like, I that would be really cool, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to keep up with everyone. I just want to know who they are. I just don't matter. But seven times, I mean, that certainly puts it into perspective about how small the world is and how closely we are intertwined in different ways. So then the next step for networking would be develop your pitch. So everyone needs an elevator pitch. That 30 second to a minute pitch that you can do in the elevator, and we can go over to FHT sometime and you can ride with me and I'll talk to you in the elevator and you can do your pitch. But this is a worksheet just to, we're going to go through it, just take a few minutes to uh, talk about it and kind of work through what is your elevator pitch. Do you have one? Do you guys have an elevator pitch? Kind of? I have one more for non academic audience. Like yeah. when my relative asked me what I'm doing online, like yeah. <laughs> to justify what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. So take a look. The things that you should really start out with, the opening statement being about you. Tell who you are, your role, your location. And you're going to edit this many times. This is again just to give you an outline to start looking at what, what it might be. And guys online, I will email this to you so just so that you can have it. Uh, and I apologize that I didn't get it to you earlier. So developing your pitch, this is about you. What is the opening statement? What grabs people's attention? A hook. What do you have to offer? What is your experience or significance? You can write on these sheets as you're thinking about it. Just jot down anything. I think we need different pitches for different roles, I suspect. You would. Is it because they're one pitch for, our, for ourselves? Or? In a professional setting and a personal setting, absolutely. But most of the time, you're going to start out at least with the same kind of catchphrase or that first hook. It, yeah, it just depends. How about that? What do you think? 
I'm I'm thinking about here. I'm wearing a the, the C4 hat is one pitch. Yes. I'm wearing a CCTX hat is a different pitch. Um, the hockey range is totally different pitch. Right. Um, <laughs> Professional versus personal. Yeah. Yes. Even within the, even the spaces, yeah. there's even some contextualization depending on. You know, if we have different roles in our personal and professional. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> And two, Becky, I think it may depend too on who you're talking to, because I, you know, to me, I don't think that one blanket paragraph necessarily will speak to everybody. Sometimes you have to reach somebody where they are. And I know if you're yeah. meeting somebody for the first time or in an elevator, you may not know that. But right. I would certainly approach people in different ways that are peers versus people that look older than me or look younger than me. So I think that that's a great, a great point. So again, just a basic statement. And as you're going into places where you know you're going to be networking, as conference season is starting back up now, you know you're going to be in situations where you're going to be around people and networking is expected or you need to be networking to be able to get to that next step so have that prepared before you go know what you're going to say so that when you get in that situation you will be ready to have that conversation practice with friends and family they can give you feedback and then also record yourself. I hate listening to myself on tape, on the, just my voice in general, I hate it. So to record myself is actually very difficult, but it's so helpful because you can see those nuances about you speaking about things that you do that you wouldn't see otherwise. Right. And Becky, if I could just add, uh, a friend also recommended absolutely standing in front of a mirror so that you do see how much do you wave your hands? How crazy does your face get really expressive or, or is it completely monotone? But seeing what others see when you're describing yourself is, is valuable too. Yes. And Megan, I think a good addition to that is just with your facial expressions, when do you use nonverbal cues as you're talking to emphasize different points? So if it's something, you know, maybe it's not the crazy face, but just the opposite of can you use those nonverbal cues in your facial expressions to help your, your points? And then get on an elevator and try it. You know, what's the harm? So you can take these with you. You can have them to revise and edit, take a red pen and mark it up. The next tip for networking is have a buddy. So go into a situation where you don't know anyone can be very difficult. How do you deal with that? I find an extrovert. You find an extrovert, okay. <laughs> and then they just kind of shepherd you along, going with the flow, or how does that happen? Well, it's kind of like you mentioned earlier, how you just spontaneously talk to people. Um, my One of my best friends and roommate is like that. And so even though I don't personally kind of shoot the breeze with everyone at all the places we usually go to and whatnot, because I'm always with her, I feel one more comfortable talking to her too. And she's kind of done the hard work for me. Okay. And then it just makes it more comfortable for me to also kind of throw my hat to the ring and, and talk to people. Yeah. Other thoughts? Because networking can be kind of that cold calling too. And so that can be really challenging. So when I say have a buddy, have a buddy that has the same goals as you. I have the codependent networking because you've probably been with that person who, at, at least for me, we don't have the same goals. So their goal is to find the bar, sit at the bar, and just hang out. Versus me, I want to go meet everyone in the world, clearly. So that's what I'm, I want to be out there. So make sure that as you're going into these situations that you have the same goals with your buddy. Or have a strategy. Say, okay, if you're not enjoying this, do this for 30 minutes, 
then you go somewhere and then I'll catch up with you later. Whatever you need to do, but have a strategy going into it with your friend. Have you had any experiences like that? Does anyone else want to share? So then the next tip would be research people before the event. Know who's going to be at the event, know what they're doing at the event, and who you want to talk to. Why? It gives you something to talk about. Yeah. Talk about going into it. What else? A, a, don't do example. Yes. Um, so when I was interim chair, we had um, a chair candidate come who had gone to grad school at the same place I had, and we overlapped. Um, and he didn't realize that, even though I have a very distinct, like the SCDs were distinctive being at Harvard. And I was the interim chair, and he clearly researched all of the older men in the department and not me. Mm -hmm. um, that did not, I cannot say that was impressive. <laughs> I was <laughs> against this candidate. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, not <laughs> so what? Words, but you're thinking you yeah. the chair. The yeah. Chair. Right. That would be a good thing to do, especially if you're taking the time to research others. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So some things that you'll automatically know. You'll know the audience, right? You'll know why people are gathering in the same place. Sometimes it is specifically for networking events, and everyone has different roles, different jobs. It is. There are very few commonalities in it, but do a quick audience analysis. Who is who's there? What are they there for? What is the professional affiliation, personal affiliation? And then try to find those commonalities, those connections that you may have with different people and reinforce those. Other thoughts about how you would go up to somebody at an event? Much easier if you have an introduction. So again, going back to the buddy, if you can have people introduce themselves, you know, have that buddy. Ann Smith up in MHRC is the best about this. She, you know Trudy, she will introduce you to everybody that when you're with her. And it's very helpful because it does provide that introduction. Other thoughts? And then when you forget people's names, this is a trick that I have. I always introduce whoever's with me first because sometimes I won't remember someone's name and that's just on me because I won't think about it immediately. But I'll always introduce the person with me and then they will introduce themselves or take over. And that way it's a good fit because then the other person will wind up saying their name and introducing themselves and then I'll remember. So again, pre-plan with your buddy. Say, hey, if I introduce you first, make sure that you wait and let them introduce you because I'm not going to remember their names. Um, and then pay attention and relate. So a lot of literature says, you know, the being present talks about making sure that you are there mentally, that you are there physically, and then trying to find ways to relate to people in different situations. For me, creating a mnemonic helps. So I've told y'all about in, in public speaking, when you do the first base, second, first, second, third home with remembering your three major points. I also do it with remembering facts about people. So home base would be the person's name. And then a professional interest would be first base. Second base, personal interest, third base, something that you have in common. And then before that you leave the conversation, always mentioning their name so that you can remember. So the, <laughs> the other thing that I liked about this graphic is it shows foul lines and it shows other things. So if you can think about those, if your mind can hold more information than that as you're going through a networking event, and they say typically only five, try to only network with five people in an hour's time, that that's all that you, you can really take in. And so with this graphic, I like the foul lines too, because it, it also shows, well, I don't need to talk about this. Don't need to talk about this with this person. So you can start adding in more, more spots in your mnemonic as you feel more comfortable with it. 
And then the on deck box with this one too. I like it because there's always going to be people around you. And it's such a distraction because sometimes you think, oh, I need to go talk to that person. How do I wrap up this conversation? But then you're not present. You're not in the moment. You're not listening to the person that you've already engaged with. So finish the conversation and then go see the person on deck. That's my thoughts about that. Does anybody else have tips that they do? Okay. Crickets. What about online? Do you guys have any tips online that y'all do for remembering people's information? I definitely try and introduce someone as quickly as possible to a third person because that's going to cement their their name and their facts to me that much faster. But I'm horrific at remembering names. And I thought it was just my dad being goofy when he couldn't do it. But now I realize it's genetic and it's so embarrassing. <laughs> not only do I not remember names correctly, but somehow I changed the pronunciation in my head. It's so awful, you guys. So if you ever meet me in person, speak slowly and clearly <laughs> and let me say your name back to you four times and we'll be besties forever. <laughs> I've heard of sometimes if they give you a business card immediately after you um, get done talking with them, maybe jot down some notes. And so later when you're you know back at your office and you're wanting to reconnect, you, you have all that information and you don't have to have it memorized per se when you're at a big conference and meeting a lot of people. Yes, both of those excellent tips. So introducing the person immediately if you can or as soon as possible and then writing down information on the back of a business card. I'm finding that people are using business cards less and less. I don't know if you guys see that or not, but people don't keep them in them even if they have them idle. So I think that's just a, a different phase that we're in. So then be confident. Going into a networking situation is intimidating, especially when you may not know anybody or you think that other people in the room are at a different level than you for whatever reason. So these are just some tips about coming across confident versus arrogant. And I really like this, especially the one acts like a fool and feels like it because sometimes I'm just goofy and I think that I'm weird you know I'm just sometimes I'm just different and I think that only that and being confident in that is always helpful approach of strangers because doesn't doubt the value of company and conversation I think that's a powerful statement in itself to be confident that you have something to give just as much as anyone else does. And knowing, and knowing that your expertise and you, you are the expert on yourself. And so when you're talking about yourself, no one else is gonna talk about you better than you can. And then always making sure not to, not to sound smarter than you actually are. I guess, this, I mean, this admits arrogance or ignorance, excuse me, but not trying to talk up in a way that can be disengaging. Other thoughts about this? Is there anything you would add to this? Yes. Use humor. 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 Yeah. I think being inclusive is really important because we were all once the person who didn't know anyone or didn't know this exact person and you know kind of setting an example of being someone who kind of continues the chain of goodwill introducing people kind of makes you seem like a person people want to know mm -hmm. again coming back to the social capital idea being a person that people want to know want to come back to building your social capital in that way so that people will want to do that Other thoughts? Okay, so some things that you could do before going into a networking situation 
is power posing. That's what I tell students before they give their speeches, go to the bathroom, do some, some power poses. Uh, I listen to my, my music. That's me, my jam. So whether it's living on a prayer by Bon Jovi this morning um, or <laughs> whatever it is, I listen to it to make me feel confident and enjoy it. Um, so figuring out what, what you do. Have a standard opener. So this is a little bit different than your pitch. How is an opener different than your pitch? Shorter. Shorter. So your opening, your opener is just going to get you into the conversation. It's going to get people to back away from each other a little bit so that you can kind of stand next to them in the group. What is in your pitch is going to be after your opener typically once you get into that situation. What are some openers that you guys have used? Oh, we're so quiet this morning. <laughs> I can think of a bad one. Yeah, well, tell me about it. <laughs> uh, it's, there are no words, actually. It's just like um, a group of people are crowded around and they're laughing, and you come in laughing too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I try to, I always feel awkward about, like, it's, it'd be really easy to compliment someone's like outfit or appearance, but I don't want that to kind of signal that that is somehow detracting from them as a person and their ideas. Um, but at least in like a conference situation, I probably saw them at one of the same talks earlier. Mm -hmm. And so I can, you know, mention, or if you were just at the same event with one speaker, well, what did you think of, you know, how did you like the um, speech that the person gave or what did you think about you know the point that someone made in you know that panel we were both at earlier yeah i try to do things like that so basically a question mm -hmm. ask me a question yeah uh, mm -hmm. well yeah so I, I question for you sarah like oh. what and this is for everybody what would detract you from wanting to give a compliment though you said mentioning your ideas and I say this because last week I was in Panera and this gentleman walked up to me and he said, you look fly today. And I was like, whoa, I mean, clearly this was a younger gentleman. <laughs> was like, oh. So my friend that I was with, she said, I told you, you look cute. And I didn't get that response. <laughs> but just that difference of opinion, you know, just to have that unexpected person to walk up to you and tell you something, give you a compliment that you weren't expecting, just kind of makes you feel good, right? And I remember that, and I wish I'd gone to talk to him more, but hindsight's 2020, he could be my best friend now if I had just <laughs> talked to him more. Then why not? Why not make somebody feel? And, and that's kind of my new goal, is to make somebody feel as good as that made me feel, just because. So other things, any other ones that you guys have? Yeah. I think if you have researched your background and you know something about them, like for me, I knew that these two people who were facilitating my meeting were a part of different sororities. And so I knew that they had just had a founder's day and I said, well, happy founder's day. And they're like, oh, you know that, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know? And so that definitely broke the ice and gave me, you know, they gave me smiles. Yeah, absolutely. Doing something unexpected, I think is part of it too. So whether it's noticing, a lapel pin and having a conversation about it or, or whatever those cues are. Any other ones that you guys use online? Okay, and then that looks good. Where did you find that? That's referring to food or beverages. <laughs> so <laughs> if, um, if you see somebody walking around with a plate or food, <laughs> you can always stop and say, that looks good. Where did you find that? And then follow up. The main thing with networking is don't do it unless you're going to take the time to follow up. Truly, it's not worth your time or the person that you're trying to network's time because it is giving of yourself and plan ahead. How are you going to follow up with people? Have messages already prepared so that when you get back to your laptop that night or when you get back to UAB after being at a conference, where are those messages that you're going to send? Be able to do it quickly 
They say within two days, you should be able to you should follow up with people that you network with. After a week, it kind of gets tricky because you start losing some of that. And the person that you often network with is not going to remember as well. Okay, so have messages ahead of time. Have some examples where you can just insert different people's names. And that is it for the presentation.